right, Professor Ark here again with yet another video all about life in the ancient world. This time today, as you can plainly see, at least I hope you can see, it's all about Roman sexuality. This is a companion piece, you might say, to my lecture on Greek sexuality, which you can also find here on this site. First, of course, well, I can't forget this. We need a word from our sponsor. Thanks again to our sponsor, The Past. And by the way, if you might think you might like to know more about Roman sexuality or Roman history, be sure to check out my other videos. Don't forget to hit the little subscribe button. Also, the little bell, which will tell you when the next History Waits for No One video will be posted. Now, like the Greeks, the Romans were very open about sexuality, but very restrictive about who you could have sex with, which is really the opposite of modern Americans, where you can pretty much sleep and have sex with whoever you please, well, unless it's consensual, of course, uh, but don't dare to even try to show it on regular television mention anything on regular broadcast radio or anything else, 
people freak out. And by the way, if you haven't seen my video on Greek sexuality, please check it out. Anyway, like the Greeks, the Romans considered sex was a gift from Venus, the goddess of love, beauty, and sex and good times. Life, remember, it was dangerous, brutal, short, almost unbearable. But sex made it somewhat bearable. Also, like the Greeks, the Romans did not consider sex sinful. It was not a sin. Why? Because they did not believe in sin. Their religion did not recognize sin. They thought anybody who did believe in sin were idiots, and they laughed at them. Religion without sin, without guilt. How weird. Anyway, at least up until 200 BC. And uh, these pictures here are not just for titillation. These are frescoes on the walls of various brothels in Pompeii, and there are probably elsewhere. They just haven't survived. The Christians, and early Christians, did a very good job once they took over, destroying all this stuff. Uh, apparently, the idea was if you want to go to a brothel and you were either illiterate or you may be ashamed to actually say it, you could just point to one of these and say, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And they gladly provided to you. And they had painted advertisements like this um, right outside the walls or a sign hanging from the brothel. Nobody said boo about it. Nobody really cared. And like the Greeks, there are thousands, tens of thousands of items, phallic jewelry, something that's available almost always to fellas, Charm bracelets, necklaces, or charms to put on your bracelets, necklaces, rings, wind chimes, oil lamps, bricks on the walls, statues, the advertisements I mentioned, and so forth. They're usually kept under lock and key. The only academics can look at them. Occasionally, there'll be an exhibition, but restricted. Because, of course, in modern society, Europe and America, people freak out if children even dare to even think about this stuff. Imagine what Dr. Freud would say about some of these exhibits and things. Uh, when I was studying, when I was doing research in the British Museum, when it was still the British Library, and I was looking at medieval manuscripts, the museum part had an exhibit on one of these, and I decided to, what the heck, I'm also interested in the ancient world, so I might as well go in. And I, I found it hard, along with others, to, to not laugh, because some of this is just so over the top. It's unbelievable. I mean, bricks in the walls, stuff like this. It was right in the wall. It wasn't up necessarily up high. It was right in the side. And often people would touch the head, this part, that head, as you went by for good luck. It was considered a good luck charm and a fertility charm. And then here, let me get my head out of the way here. Other head. There's the winged flying penis. We saw one of those. This is the god Priapus. He's a fertility god. He brings, make sure your crops grow correctly. Here he is again with, oh, oh my God, he's got, it's it's everywhere. It's coming out of his head. Again, another one of these bricks. And look at this stuff. Unbelievable. Oh, let me get this out of the way here. Here is a ring with, oh, I don't even want to talk about what it is. Um, these are oil, most of these are oil lamps. So you put the oil in here and you put the, the the wick and you burn it. And there are lots of these. Here's a three-way. Another bronze one. I think you could hang this one up. This one, what is coming? Oh, my God. Is it that big? Coming off of this guy. This Yeah, this one's just nasty. Look at this thing. It's, a, it's another oil lamp and it's just coming out of his, oh, my God. I mean, look at these. Um... These are wind chimes. Yeah, wind chimes. Imagine hanging that up in your house today, outside. What the, would the neighbors say? This, hey, at first, I thought this might be like a juicer. You know, the old juicers where you put the an orange or grapefruit on top and kind of squeeze it around like that. No, nope. uh, it's a bird feeder. How weird. And there are many others. If you want to see more, go and look at my one on Greek sexuality. Now, Romans, prostitution was legal. Didn't care. Didn't have to worry about STDs for the most part. 
there was some. They really didn't matter. You would have to worry about pregnancy, but okay. Now, while many prostitutes were slaves, many free women did work as prostitutes. Known in Latin as a lupa. There are some other names, but lupa is the wolf girl for some reason. And usually they would work out of a brothel called in Latin a lupinarium, a wolf's den. And there it is managed by a pimp, which in Latin is called a leno. Not a J leno. Let's hope that he doesn't know about that. Or a madam called a lena. Leno, lena. That's the Latin form. And they had to ensure that the prostitute was registered with the local authorities. She had to register under both her real name and her working names. Well, strategically, rather strategically placed by this painter, I see. Also, they needed to find out, registered by her age, her place of birth, and she had a license and paid taxes. Failure to register or pay taxes would result in a severe flogging. Not so much for the prostitute, but more for the pimp or madam. It's their property. Also, confiscation of property and exile for repeat violations, though we know of many lupas, lenos, and lenas who apparently never bothered to register and never really suffered any consequences. Now, in terms of homosexuality, Romans at first condemned homosexuality, unlike the Greeks. But in the 2nd century BC, and there are some other scholars who still dispute why it changed, the consensus so far is still the 2nd century BC, and the Romans themselves said this, um, after the war with Hannibal, they started to conquer in Greece, and they began to bring home thousands, tens of thousands of Greek slaves. And that really does change Roman society. You know more about that in my lecture on Roman history. But this seems to have led to toleration of sorts. As many Greek slaves introduced their masters to homosexuality. There were verbal slurs. Julius Caesar, when he was young, was derided as possibly engaging when he was a boy, engaging in sex with the king of Bithynia when he was marooned there. Caesar always said no, but in political stuff, you know, almost anything goes. They threw dirt around then as much as they do today. So it was common to verbally make fun of people, but there was no violence as there's no case that have come to light that of people committing violence because of uh, people were gay. The idea, however, was that Roman men always had to be the dominant or the top partner. Being the bottom partner was too effeminate, and it's almost like being an animal. Uh, I actually kind of love this uh, a vase, the Warren vase. Two guys going ahead, and of course, the interesting thing is this guy here. Can you imagine what he's saying? Uh, is it sort of you know, almost write your own caption? Uh, Hey guys, what you doing? Or uh, uh, master, is this a uh, is this a bad time to ask for a raise? Now, another thing, um, lesbians and trisex transsexuals, uh, whom the Romans called trabades, that's the term for the transsexual, did exist. Both were condemned by the Romans. Lesbians mostly because they did not have, they did not marry and have children. The male transsexuals were considered worse. Female transsexuals were okay. Why? Well, because the idea is the Romans, which they took on from the Greeks, that the male is a superior nature. And then below that is the female. So a female trying to act like a male. Well, she's just trying to better herself, and that was okay. But a male trying to act as a lesser being, a female, is, well, it's better than trying to act like an animal, but not by much. At least that's the Romans thought.
So, as Cicero once said, you tell him, Marco, if there is anyone who holds the opinion that young men should be forbidden from intrigues with the prostitutes of Rome, he is indeed austere, as he had at odds not only with the habits of our ancestors, for when was this not done? When was it rebuked? When found fault with? Yeah, you tell him, Tullius. Okay, so, if you enjoyed this video, I know it's short, short and sweet, and want to learn more, be sure, of course, to hit like, share, and subscribe. Make sure to hit that little bell so you can be uh, notified when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. You can, of course, always catch History Waits for No One on its own Facebook group and on Twitter. You can also get a hold of me on Instagram and Reddit. Also on the email, History Waits for No One, all one word, at gmail.com. In the meantime, I hope you engage and tell me what you liked and what you didn't like about this video. Um, how me, how it might be improved and whether a longer version might well be warranted. Just go ahead and engage here in the comments down below. And I thank you for watching and hope to see you again in another video. So long.